Hello there, Force of Will players, and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be taking a look at the next set of spoilers over the past week. I'm sorry this video is kind of a day late. I do want to get the Friday spoilers in the video, and I was unfortunately busy at night, so I wasn't able to make the video until today, uh, but it will be uh, also released today, Saturday, July 16th. Um, so, I'm getting right on into it. Starting off, we ended with Child of the Wind, Moon, and Justice last week. So I don't know what I what I was reading last week for Child of the Wind, Moon, but basically all it is is you the the cancel is anything that's paid without paying will. So Virgil, so cards with mastery that like uh, like it was the hero slash right 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 where is it? Like, uh, da, da, da. this card, flash from behind, you may rest a recovered hero or J resonator you control rather than pay this card's cost. Um, like other mastery things, right? So, <coughs> excuse me. So, like, masteries is what it can cancel, which is primarily probably what it's designed to cancel within the set. Uh, so, like, other things like that. Um, uh, awakenings, uh, I'd, ha I'd have to look. I think awakenings are considered additional costs. Um, so, uh, so like stuff like that. So that is what Child of the Wind Moon is allowed to cancel. Um, so just wanted to re-clarify that. Moving forward, <laughs> so we got uh, the Osaka um, announcement, I guess, for the actual like instead of because there's the structure deck Osaka and then the um, set Osaka, um, and then the Moon Child is Child of the Darkness Moon, so filter into green or darkness, and then the God's Art is to destroy target J Resonator. Pretty impactful. Um, Child of the Wind... So we have confirmation that you can actually sideboard um, uh, Moon Children. Um, I'm, I'm like 90% sure you can sideboard Moon Children. I'm pretty sure that in the article where they talk about how um, like Moon Child's work and things like that, they say that you can sideboard them. Um, so in this case, Child of the Wind Moon is like a very good like sideboard tech, um, and like a lot of the times, uh, like Child of the Fire Moon might be a good sideboard tech, but like so far, the best like generic children, I believe, are going to be Light Moon and then um, Darkness Moon. <coughs> they just, they'll just hit the most things, um, they're the most prevalent. That being said, they are in four completely different colors light red and then darkness green so who knows but uh it is like a it is something interesting to think about um just with like generic use of the um like usage of their god's arts and things like that right so uh so far those are the two that i could i would probably see myself if i'm just looking for them for their effects not their filter and even then uh, with their filter, it it gives you so much more. Like you're, you just don't have a blue filter, right? So as long as you're not predominantly like in blue, um, or if you even if you are predominantly in blue, you can have your stone deck be ten blue sources, and then you have a filter into other colors at least once per turn. So it, it has interesting implications. Um, and then uh, the legendary vampire. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm just kind of waking up. I have to go somewhere this weekend, and I wanted to make sure this video got out. But <laughs> so, Nile uh, Legendary Vampire. It's another mill card, actually. Um, so you put the top X cards of the deck into your grave, and then you destroy any number of non-Magic Stone, non-Cocoon entities um, with a combined total cost of X or less, where X is the number of Magic Stones you control. And then, if there are seven or more cards in your grave, you can contract. Um, so it kind of, uh, Asuka is looking to work well with, like, self-mill and other stuff like that, um, which, I mean, we've seen self-mill stuff in the past, uh, harvesting season, um, Tsukiyomi technically works as self-mill from the, uh, the most recent Game of Gods set with Athenia's new stuff, um, things like that. So it'll be interesting if we get more self-mill with Asuka, but the implication of that with other like older decks, right, also means that other older self mill decks also might get more mill. <laughs> so it might make them more powerful as well, which would be an interesting um, like area to go into. 
Um, and then uh, Asuka's contract on the back of Night of the Legendary Vampire is you can choose any number of target resonators with a combined total cost of X or less in all graves and play them without paying their cost, where X is the number of magic stones you control. So it's uh, kind of neat um, because the contract occurs at the end of the resolution of the card. You can R you whatever you destroy with Night of the Legendary Vampire, um, you can then bring back with the end of night flip side of the contract um which can be quite powerful because it says in all graves so you can steal your opponent's stuff as well um so if if they're like a resurrection deck or something like that you can take their own stuff and then play through like for example if they put like zuzliangs in their grave they're like a brunhild self mill deck and unite a legendary vampire contract um you get end of night you get like two zuzliangs you now have like two free red will and then you can kind of go wherever you want to go with that. Um, but like, uh, or would it be two? Yeah, they'd come in simultaneous. Or no, they'd see each other because they come in simultaneously. So you would get four free red will if you brought two usually hangs back at the same time. So it's just um, it's quite a lot. <laughs> so it's uh, the the implications for it are quite interesting. And then there's always just like the normal stuff, right? Like Makage Rea dumps. Um, into like griffin and like other things like that right because we are wanting magic stones so doing like griffin part of true power uh guardian of the magic kingdom the new gretel <coughs> all those things uh, are quite powerful with end of night and what it looks like in night of the legendary vampire and what that stuff is trying to do and then we got the colorless ruler um so the thing with the colorless ruler, I have no idea how to evaluate this, right? So, because all of the new rulers are based on their bonds and cocoons, and we kind of have their bonds, oh, and their contracts. And so we kind of have their bonds. The thing with Ainz, right, is that you have to reveal gears that don't share names with other revealed gears. And he gains the abilities of all of those gears that are revealed outside the game. And then his um, contract is an enter where you can put any number of gears you own into play and you get to destroy something. And I guess it is also a gears. <laughs> um, and then it showed the Solaris edition because he gets a Homeland Solaris edition instead of a Homeland uh, Cocoon. Um, and then it shows his contract in order to get into Levitine Chrono Gear. But the contract for Flight of the Demon Sword is you can only use it, you can only play it by using will produced by gear entities. And if you control seven or more gears um, in the field and own revealed outside the game, you can contract, right? So it's looking to be something similar. It, it feels almost Union 70, if that makes sense, um, where it's like you'll want gears in your deck, but also need gears from outside the game in order to facilitate like all of it. So the question is, how many gears are we going to get? Because this says a light, fire, water, wind, or darkness gear, right? So the implication is we're going to have at least one gear of each attribute. But that being said, if we need them in play and we need will produced by gear entities, that means the gears themselves can produce will. So they're effectively dorks, like mana dorks, right? And if we're playing these mana dork gears, then it's like the that this version of the deck might just be better. Like, this just might be a good deck because it's everything has, like, will production. But then it's like, what if only, like, the wind one has will production? Um, so we just don't know. Uh, it's so hard to evaluate this stuff, having no idea what the gears do, right? Um, and the fact that, like, Ainz gains their abilities on his ruler side. So it's like, how are they producing will, I guess, is the best, like, is what is we need to know um in addition like what are their other effects right so like if i like because this because he says he gains their abilities just the ones revealed from outside the game not the ones you just raw play it's what do the ones we raw play do 
Um, are they good enough for us to raw play them in the main? How many do we get to play in the main? How many are there total, right? Like what are producing will, what's not, so on and so forth. So it's just a little complex. When we see all five colors of the gears, uh, we'll kind of know. Maybe it'll be along the same vein as um, Dante's uh, Dark Spheres, where they had dual attributes. Um, but we just kind of have to wait and see. So it's pretty hard to evaluate, but destroy any entity um, and then contract is pretty good. Um, so, but other than, and for one mana, quick cast. But other than that, uh, don't don't really know how to evaluate that card. <laughs> and outer space, uh, you draw a card, your opponent pays one more play judgment or revolution orders, and then target J Resonator loses swiftness and flying until end of turn. So outer space is quite powerful. It basically means you start with a six card hand, so you're kind of like Mooj Dart. Um, and then your opponent paying one more to do judgment or revolution order effects. Paying one more to do revolution order is massive. Because that means that um, even if you, as like the Ainz player, go first, your opponent, if they go second on Revolution Order, can't Revolution Order until the following turn, because they have to call a stone and then like perform Revolution Order, um, which th is huge. That is such such a big step down for that deck. And then um, same concept with like. Uh, uh, with like if they go first, right? Because then they'd have to call two stones, which means they're not revolution ordering for at least two turns. And the other thing with this one is it's not it's not even that bad to like main deck this or like sideboard like four of them uh, just to like kind of hose revolution order decks. The only weakness of outer space, the best part about outer space is that it comes into play immediately. We'll see if there are other Solaris editions that are better, but. Um, the uh, the thing with outer space is that it doesn't have any form of protection. So since it doesn't have any form of protection, it's quite easy to be dealt with. However, because it's just one void to play, it is so generic. You could probably play this in all of the like new cocoon ruler decks, uh, or you could even play this in other revolution order decks or like other things like that um, in order to facilitate like more additions into play and slowing down like your opponent's game plan. Though actually playing it might be a little bit difficult, right? Things like Gary on so on and so forth. Um, in addition to just uh, like other forms of removal type effects, it does slow your opponent down. But I do think the best part of outer space for like those kinds of decks is how Eins just puts it into play immediately. So we'll see how well oh Eins is a gears as well. We'll see how well Eins does um, against like order and like other things like that after i think these are all the rulers um we'll see like the other j ruler sides and stuff as we get more contracts um out of all the rulers i think justice like the this contract this specific contract with falchion is like one of the most powerful ones and then i think eins is probably second i'd probably put osaka third um maybe messiah third fourth berserker fifth and then um the aristella uh sixth light blue just typically isn't great but we do have some other cards for them uh and then we have the new marvel rares so we have some marvel rares that came out as as well as the first like instance of cocoon editions so um the interesting thing about the cocoons um is that uh they're killable they're all killable right <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty sure most of them are killable. Uh, however, it's they start in play, which is the relevant thing. Um, so we got our first cocoon, which is light blue, great wall of the sac 12 sacred knights, enters, draws a card, same concept, you start at six cards in hand. Uh, so you kind of have like this move dart type deal. Uh, you gain barrier, so you cannot be targeted. Uh, and then you prevent all damage that will be dealt to you if 900 or more damage is prevented by this ability this turn, destroy this card. So the interesting thing, um, uh, we'll, we'll, I'll actually go through that in a second, um, after we go over some more cocoons. Um, quite good for like aggro matchups, things like that. Uh, again, you gain barrier, also strong. Um, it prevents your opponent from using like thunders or other things like that on you. 
the discard effects that say like your opponents still slip through it, but it's not that big of a deal. Um, confronting Eines, so you may play this card without paying its cost if your opponent has drawn three or more cards this turn, draw two. So it's quick cast for one. Oh no, quick cast for three. So quick cast for zero. It's not just the colorless cost. So you get a free draw two if your opponent has drawn three or more cards. I'd have to see how much draw power is in the game. Because, <laughs> like, if you play Outer Space, like, if, if we look at Solaris and then, like, Outer Space, right? Like, they get a free card on the first turn of the game, but how often are they going to draw two more cards <laughs> on the first turn? Um, the, relying on your opponent to do something in order to, like, generate more value off this card is meh. The other thing is this means your opponent like cycled three cards and then you're only getting plus one in value off of this where if your opponent never does this or generates value other ways you're never going to generate value off of this right because like if you think of like a stemma belial that deck would draw a card every turn but never like three cards in a single turn and if you activated belial's god's art and killed something with like a stemma with a stemma on its ruler side then you would be still only drawing two cards. It would have to be like you activate Belial's God's Art with a Stemma on a Stemma's flip side and had killed something in order to hit that part, and that was like one of the best value decks that has ever existed in this game. So I don't think this card will see a whole lot of play. Um, if it wasn't quick cast, it would well, it wouldn't really work if it didn't have quick cast, but, um, but yeah, no, I, don't, I don't think this card is that great. And then our first Marvel Rare, Flight of the Holy Sword, Light Blue, Quick Cast. Non-Magic Stone Entities, you control, gain Eternal and Barrier until end of turn. And then until end of game, you may play all God's Arts you already played this game an additional time, and you can awaken it by paying two more to contract this with Aristella. And then the contract on the back is Excalibur Chrono Gear, uh, which is an enter, destroy all other non-Magic Stone Entities, draw a card, and players cannot chase to this ability. That's quite strong. Um, and then if damage would be dealt to you, it's dealt to this card instead. So this has the same kind of context as, um, is it Light of Zeus? I think it's Light of Zeus. So Light of Zeus says, like, destroy all J Resonators, um, but you give your stuff eternal first, right? So, like, same concept with Flight of the Holy Sword. So everything, you, all non-Magic Stone entities you control gain eternal, and then if you contract it, you destroy all their non-magic stone entities. So it's like a one-sided board wipe. Of course, they can be blanked or other things like that. Um, well, actually, this one, they couldn't be blanked in response, which is actually a lot... Well, they couldn't do it... Oh, you couldn't do it to Light of Zeus anyway, because it's all part of the same resolution of an effect. It's really interesting that they're just doing it like that. So you can't even blank things. Um, but yeah, so just giving all your stuff eternal barrier and then... Uh, blowing up your <laughs> opponent's whole board besides stones and then also drawing to a card and they can't stop it um quite quite strong um so it's a very very good board wipe um having a board wipe is like awkwardly white blue like control has like awkwardly kind of been a deck in the past with like faria and other things like that so we might be seeing it move in that kind of like way again into like light blue control i mean same thing with like mooge dart almarius right like white blue has always been this like weird control deck um so i guess that's kind of what they're going for um uh the the second half of flight of the holy sword with the extra gods arts is something that's very interesting to play around with um because that works with other things like belial like you can play light blue whatever belial dante right um and so that that is quite impactful um and the thing with it being with belial is even though you just go down a card to play these god's arts um you still belial's god's art being draw a card means it'll replace itself each time so even like belial is modius Actually, Belial Asmodeus... Ooh, this card's probably so good in Belial Asmodeus. Belial Asmodeus, um, Union 7, New 12 Olympians. This card's probably cracked. Um, but yeah, so stuff like that is super fun with Val 2. It's super fun getting all those gods arts. Uh, time Spinning Witch uh, with Distortion of Time. 
uh, things like that, right? So Flight of the Holy Sword has a lot of application in older decks as well as the new deck, um, or the newer decks, but a uh, very, very fun card. Uh, Judgment of Solari, another Marvel rare. Uh, if you choose one, if you control a ruler under contract, you may choose up to three instead. Um, we know a ruler is under contract because it would be flipped over, so there's an easy way to tell that. Uh, deal 300 multiplied by X to your opponent, where X is the number of cards in your opponent's hand. You gain that much life. Um, destroy all non-magic stone, non-J ruler, non-J resonator entities your opponent controls, so that'll destroy additions without eternal. And that's it. <laughs> um, or regalia, I guess. Uh, destroy all rested J resonators your opponent controls. Interesting. And then Mastery with Messiah, which is a contract, um, the contract we've seen with uh, Mika. Uh, I don't like this card. It not being quick cast is so bad, but it's basically free if you have Messiah. It being reliant on cards in your opponent's hand is kind of meh too. Rested. I don't really think you're resting anything. Sorry, I had an alarm go off. Um, hmm, this doesn't seem that impactful for a Marvel rare. Because I don't think... I could be wrong, but I don't think Mika's stuff is resting their stuff. So I just, I'm, I'm just not, like, a huge fan of this card. Um, we'll, we'll see, like, what it... Like, maybe application it has, or, like, other things that, like, Mika slash Messiah, like, get. Um, but I'm not... Outside of the gate, I'm not, like, a huge fan of this card. Because, like, if your opponent has, like, on average five cards in hand, right? Like, they're gonna take 15, and you'll gain 15, which is a pretty big swing. But then, like, you'll destroy their additions. So, like, if you're playing against a new ruler, you get rid of their cocoon. Maybe the gears are additions, so it's really good against Ainz. Um, but, like, you don't destroy, like, Zeus's edition. You wouldn't destroy Typhon's edition. Um, you wouldn't destroy many of the arena <laughs> expansions. Um, and then Rested J Resonators means your opponent probably attacked with them. But, like, if this was quick cast, it would be so much better <laughs> to destroy <laughs> J Resonators. Because it could function as, like, a burn and then also, like, a board clear slash attack like negate kind of um so we'll, we'll we'll see we'll we'll see what happens with with this one but i'm i am not a super big fan of it out the gate uh and then solaria religious nation uh card enters the field arrested uh light red and then each player puts a 4-4 light human resonator into the field banish a resonator token you gain life equal to its defense um good since you're like buffing your tokens and things like that uh, I didn't actually go over them last time. Let me see if James put these on here. Okay, he hasn't. There are also a um, buy a box and the pre-release promos, and they're I believe they're one is red and I believe the other one is light, and they're reliant on your opponent having a token. <laughs> and I think the red one is like you destroy a token your opponent has, um, and then you draw two cards and discard a card which means you would go value neutral, and the card itself is, like, just one mana. So giving both players tokens works very well for Solari, or for, like, that concept of a deck. The other thing is with um, Messiah's contract, or Mika's contract, uh, a J Resonator you control and a J Resonator your opponent controls have to be destroyed uh, to contract into Messiah. So there are probably going to be a lot of cards that either kill tokens or other things like that. So you'll be wanting to give your opponent more tokens, other things, so on and so forth. So, excuse me, uh, interesting uh, concept. I like the token generation they're going for, like red light tokens, and like Boros tokens. We've seen that before, but uh, it's it's an interesting concept to go, and I like I like the idea of it. We'll see it in practice. Uh, Sealed One-Eyed Dragon. This card is cracked out of its mind. Um, pay 600 life, discard this card. This card deals 600 damage to target player or J Resonator. Pay 600, discard this card, draw a card. So it, you either pay 600, discard it, and draw one, which means it just replaces itself for 600 life. 
um, or you can kill something effectively. Six, 600 hits most things that are a single, like a one drop. Uh, two drops tend to be larger than 6-6 six, six nowadays, but um, this will hit pretty much any one drop, and you're paying zero mana for it. Um, and then uh, you can pay two, the same cost, uh, Darkness Red, Darkness Fire. Uh, play this ability only if this card is in your grave and you lost life this turn in any way, which means it discarding itself for its effect. You can put this card from the grave into the field, it gains swiftness, and at the next end of turn, its controller banishes this card. So even though... So it gaining swiftness and having precision and bane, right? So you can pay 600 to cycle it, like discard it, draw one, and then you can pay two to also give it swiftness, and then since it has precision bane, you can kill something. So not only does it trade neutral, like value neutral, you just pay two to effectively kill something. So it trades up one in value just via itself, um, which is quite strong for like any value deck. Um, 600 life is kind of steep, not for uh, Typhon. <laughs> this card is darkness, and that is why this card is so cracked, I think, because you just like insta slot four of these into Typhon. There's like no reason you wouldn't. Um, just because one, it thins the Typhon deck, and then two, like the. You're already playing other life loss cards in the form of like Final Battle, things like that. Um, so just it, you you have other ways to proc the effect rather than just the dragon like pitching itself or whatever um which means it's just going to be like more impactful the other thing is like the burn gives typhon more like direct damage as well um so like that that's the other thing to think about like even if you don't need to use this card as like a removal tool if you pitch it to deal 600 to your opponent and then res it that's 1300 damage so it can just be random damage out of nowhere um, that your opponent like can't really deal with. So like sealed one eyed dragon is so so good in Typhon. It's actually insane. Um, I don't know how much you'll see it played in like other decks. We've seen that with Berserker, you want to be below two thousand life. So I mean, I, I could see it there, right? Um, but like outside of that, like I don't know, maybe Almarius decks or other things. Not all decks necessarily need their life pool, but some of them really like it. Uh, other decks you could probably see this in would be like Darkness, like, oh, what is it? Um, like Mardu Brunhild, which is Darkness, Fire, uh, Light, um, like Aggro Brunhild. You could probably see this card in there. Again, free damage is free damage, right? Like dealing 600 to your opponent's face for effectively free, especially if you're winning the race, is so strong. And then also if you're... Um, if you're playing Zhuzhli Yang, um, it dealing damage to you is another form of life loss, and it'll give you the red will in order to play into Sealed One-Eye. Uh, the pay is not damage, and I'm pretty sure Zhuzhli Yang says when you take damage, so you can't just generate free will off of it. But, um, but no, I, I think this card's cracked. This is like one of the cool... I, I don't honest... I honestly don't think this card is that unfair. Time will tell. But, um... It just, it, it seems so well designed for a Marvel Rare for, like, the deck it's for, which is something I haven't really, really said about a Foul card in a while. Uh, but, uh, but yeah, so I really like Sealed One-Eyed Dragon. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, also a dragon, so might also be very good with just Dragon Flame in general. Um, underground Fighting Arena. Uh, your opponent cannot gain life. Fun. Uh, J resonators you control game plus X plus X where number X is the number of times J resonators you control attacked this turn. Oh, that's kind of interesting. Oh, that's so good with Berserker. Right? So like we kind of talked about I kind of talked about Berserker. How Berserker works in a sense of um, because it has Pierce and it also has the if this would deal damage to a J resonator your opponent controls it deals that much to that J Resonator and that J Resonator's controller. So it kind of has like, it has this awkward like double pierce where if it ever, if it ever gets blocked at all, um, or even if it just hits something on its own, Berserker will always deal its attack to your opponent. Always, right? Um, Cause you're always going to pierce over whatever the capacity is that you deal to the card. And then you're also going to deal whatever you deal to the card to your opponent. So it'll always deal its attack and damage to your opponent. 
So this just causes it to scale, which means instead of like, let's see, so five, five berserker attacks is 4,000, right? So with underground fighting arena, it goes eight, nine, 10, uh, 11. Is that enough? Is that enough math? <laughs> uh, 17, 27, 38. So it gives you 38 damage. So it almost kills them in four attacks instead of five. Um, which is eff is effectively one less mana, right, for you to recover. And then because of something like Sealed One-Eyed Dragon, that's just extra burn in order to finish off the last bit. Whereas before, you would have three attacks less, so it would be one, two, you would have 600 less. So you'd have to pitch two Sealed One-Eyed Dragons without Underground Fighting Arena in order to kill the opponent. Uh, the gain life thing, also super prevalent. Um, means that like your opponent can't like Lumia or like anything in order to prevent themselves from like getting out or they can't do like they can't do ooh this is so good against Typhon like the heart they can't go back to like 10,000 uh, so quite quite interesting um, ooh, that's another thing with Sealed One-Eyed Dragon I didn't think about that this with Dodgy you can send it to Grave so you can pay like play multiples if you have multiples and have the mana for it. Uh, and then finally we have uh, the Falchion ones. So we'll do so Moo Moo, uh, quick cast green and blue produce two will in any combination of green and or blue. Spend it only to play chance, and you can tap Moo Moo to recover a magic stone you control. If you control a ruler under contract, you recover up to two stones you control instead. Play this ability only once per turn and only if you play to chant this turn. So, funny that we have the Moo Moo tribe instead of the Mimi tribe now. Uh, so we see here, and we see also with Eternal, Artificial Archipelago, um, that uh, it's all about playing chance and like just playing cards with um, Falchion. So if we take a look... At Grandfather's Research Project, you draw two, put an addition with total cost one or less from your hand into the field, and if you control three or more additions, you can contract, right? And that contracts into Justice, and then Justice revolves around playing Chance. So you get a bonus when you play a, your first Chance, second Chance, third Chance, and fourth Chance each turn. Um, the thing with um, the thing with Grandfather's Research Project means you can play Outer Space in the main, which is quite strong. Um, or other one mana additions that are also powerful. Um, the thing with playing multiple chants is we'll see what they do, but just having mana generation and having your cards be able to play more cards is not inherently broken. So like, for example, Mumu giving you more mana, like effectively costing zero, right? Um, like you play, you put Mumu into play and you play a chant for zero. So you play value down, and then you just get more stones, more will, effectively. Um, the thing, the thing with Mumu is that it, unless there is a card that is like draw eight billion cards <laughs> in Falchion, it's not going to be incredibly like impactful or powerful. So like Falchion really needs some form of draw engine in order for the deck to be strong. Uh, but the thing with having like a not clunky draw engine is there are so few. Like I think the best non non clunky draw engine is probably Mirage and Four Seas right now. Especially just because they're already in blue. Um, like beforehand, it was predominantly red, right? With like sudden manifestation of power, Isis, like that whole loop. Um, but like, I mean, you play Melfi's in this deck because uh, they also count as chance. Um, maybe you probably play Prisia's just because they go back to your hand and only cost one, so they're effective value, right? So like, those are going to be like the best cards for this deck because um, they're they replace themselves is the whole point. Um, <clears throat> but we'll have to see what other stuff this deck gets, because since you kind of already have two of the best, like, chance, like, recursion chance in the game, specifically Prissy's Big Show, 
because it's just a singular green do a thing. Um, so you can proc like all of your effects. We'll have to see um, just how strong this deck gets. Because the other thing with like Prissia's Big Show is now you can Big Show into Moo Moo. So Big Show is also effectively zero, or not Big Show, um, the, the, the Resonator half of uh, Big Show. You can do that Prissia into Moo Moo, which is so now Prissia is effectively zero mana. Um, the thing with Eternal, Artificial, Archipelago, uh, I think this card's honestly fair. Like, it's fine, in my opinion. Um, other additions, you control gain barrier, and then you produce a blue or green, spend it only to play chance, and then this card doesn't recover during its controller's next recovery phase. Um, I think, so because you skip in the first turn of each, the first, the first turn of each player in the game, right? So the first, first turn of each player, uh, they skip their recovery phase. So you won't get eternal, um, until the following uh, turn, whatever your second turn may be. Um, so this means you're not going to ramp anything on turn one. It means you'll get a free will to play on turn two, but again, this can only be used to play chance. Um, so like it allows you to more easily play like Grandfather's Research Project, which is another draw, um, and then put like another addition to play, which maybe it's outer space, so you draw again. Um, so like, that that kind of loop is decent but like you would never main this card like you would never raw play eternal uh it's just too bad but it just getting ripped into play is perfectly fine and then it giving your other additions barrier is decent as well especially because it doesn't give itself barrier so you can just shoot it um it kind of causes a loop if you have i think hang on we'll, we'll, i think it's with ultising secret hideout J resonators, oh, not additions. Okay, never mind. Um, if you can find a way to give this barrier without playing another Eternal, that's quite strong. Um, but we'll we'll see. But I, I don't think this stuff's broken, not yet. Um, we'll, <laughs> time will tell. Uh, Justice feels like the strongest flip side. So that might just be <laughs> broken. <laughs> Um, but we'll, again, I guess, I guess we'll have to see. I just truly don't know, um, until we get, like, all of the other cards. But so far, um, so far I don't think it's, like, too broken. It's just, like, other weird green shit we've seen in the past. Um, but time will tell. Uh, but yeah, Sealed One-Eyed Dragon, definitely one of my, my faves of the spoilers that we've had this past week. But that'll be it for the video. Um... Do look forward to the one the following week. Uh, that one, ooh, actually, we'll see about that one. Um, I I believe I am going to Minnesota next week. We will see. I am not judging the event, um, but I need to uh, check some stuff before officially declaring <laughs> and all that. Um, but I might be there if you are there, um, and I am there. I will probably be playing. Um, and that'll be the first GP I've played in in, like, three years. So, <laughs> uh, if you're there, come on by and uh, we can have some fun and maybe play against each other. But anyway, thank you all so much for watching. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye. <laughs>